This is Dimitri Lascaris for The Real News. It's official, according to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, land temperatures this past July were the hottest on record. Including ocean temperatures, the NOAA ranked July as the second hottest month ever recorded, trailing July 2016 by less than one-tenth of one degree. Last week, an independent analysis from NASA found July 2017 to be tied with July and August of 2016 as the hottest month on record. These temperatures came after 2016 was determined to be the hottest year on record. With us to discuss this disturbing trend in global temperatures is Dr. Benjamin Horton. Dr. Horton is a professor in the Asian School of the Environment at Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. Uh, professor Horton's research concerns sea level change, and he aims to understand and integrate the external and internal mechanisms that have determined sea level changes in the past and which will shape such changes in the future. He joins us today from Singapore. A welcome to The Real News, Dr. Horton. Uh, good afternoon. So first, please tell us if there is a significant discrepancy, discrepancy between the NASA and NOAA findings with respect to temperatures in July 2017, and if so, uh, what is the significance of that discrepancy? Well, I think the, the, the most important conclusion of that is that two independent measurements of global atmosphere and ocean temperatures come out with the same conclusion that uh, the July temperatures in 2017 were anomalous. They were well above the um, long-term average of the 20th century. So slight discrepancies between them being the warmest or tied second warmest are irrelevant, really. I think the important thing for your um, um, your listeners is so that we've got two independent measurements and they use similar data sets, but they use different statistical analyses. And they come out with the same conclusion that July 2017 was approximately around 1.5 degrees Fahrenheit, greater than the 20th century average, with the warmest July um, occurring in 2016. And it's not, it's part of a trend. Nine of the 10 warmest Julys occurred in the 21st century. The only exception is a very, very warm year in 1998. And July, the and then you can start to think even more, and these numbers are astounding. In July 2017, marked the 41st consecutive July temperature that was larger than the global average, and the 391st month with global temperatures above the 20th century average. So we're just building a body of data that's irrefutable that our climate is changing. And, and these results for the uh, most recent July uh, occurred in a non-El Nino year. Could you talk to us about the significance of that? Why should it concern us that we're seeing these temperatures in July in a non-El Nino year? Well, this is all concerns natural variability. So on top of the trend of increasing temperatures to do with greenhouse gas emissions, we have the natural variability in our Earth. And one of the controlling factors for global temperatures called the El Nino Southern Oscillation, or ENSO. And this concerns the Pacific Ocean. We are a blue planet, and the Pacific Ocean is the largest. And during El Nino years, the Pacific Ocean warms up, and that amplifies the global warming effect to do with anthropogenic emissions. In the opposite or neutral years, which we are in today, you have a dampening effect. So the importance of these temperatures occurring at, at record levels is we're occurring at a time where it's just driven by anthropogenic effects, where natural variability is not enhancing the readings. Now, according to the NOAA's State of the Climate report, several other record-breaking events occurred in 2016. Among them, greenhouse gases hit their highest recorded concentration in nearly one million years. Uh, in addition, 12% of the Earth endured severe drought. Alpine glaciers retreated for the 37th year in a row, and global sea levels hit a record high. I just want to focus on the concentration of greenhouse gases and current trends in uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Given where we now stand and given current trends in greenhouse gas emissions, is it realistic to expect, is there any significant hope of us ensuring that the global temperature increase remains within the aspirational goal of 1.5 degrees Celsius set forth in the Paris Climate Accord? Or is that something which realistically uh, is not achievable at this stage, in your opinion? 
Well, I, th I think there are two points to emphasise here. For, first of all, regarding those um, carbon dioxide emissions. So we've shown through scientific research going through the paleo record that our global temperatures are very heavily linked to changes in CO2. When CO2 go up, so our global temperatures go up. And we have a very detailed record going back approximately around six or 700,000 years from ice cores. And we find that during warm periods in our climate, we have carbon dioxide emissions at around 200 180 parts per million by volume. Our current levels are 400 parts per million by, um, 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 by volume. And that indicates a huge increase as a result of us burning fossil fuels. The next question is, can we control them? So, you know, um, we have the power. So we have, as a scientific community, we always have hope regarding climate change because we have a choice. We are still... Um, able to have a choice about high emission scenarios and low emission scenarios going into the future. The low emission scenarios were agreed by all countries on the planet as part of the Paris Accord. And that was to keep the temperatures, the global mean temperatures, below 1.5 degrees C, above the pre-industrial values. And that was very important, the scientific community concluded, because that was a level that if we thought temperatures got above that, we'd get catastrophic changes to the Earth. And when we talk about catastrophic changes, we talk about the loss of the Great Barrier Reef, the largest ecosystem on our planet, the collapse of our ice sheets in Greenland and Antarctica causing multi meter rises in sea level. So that value is not arbitrary. It was based upon scientific data that we must keep below that. And we still have that choice. Um, so despite this current administration wishing to remove ourselves away from the Paris Agreement, what you can hope is that the rest of the uh, community starts to come together to start to fill in the gap that the US may leave behind. Well, let's talk a little bit about what's going on in the U.S. You're obviously referring to the Trump administration, and uh, which uh, appears to have uh, continued to suffer from a, a large dose of skepticism with respect to climate science, despite all of the results that you've just discussed. Uh, in the United States, according to Forbes magazine, gasoline demand just hit an all-time high uh, with the greatest weekly U.S. gasoline consumption ever recorded in late July. How important uh, are things such as, you know, developments within the United States in terms of uh, fossil fuel consumption and greenhouse gas emissions, and in particular, uh, gasoline consumption? How important is that to our ability uh, to remain within the target set forth in the Paris Climate Accord? Well, obviously, increasing gasoline um, consumption by the U.S. would lead to increasing carbon dioxide levels. I mean, gasoline consumption from personal cars contributes about one-fifth of all U.S. emissions. So for every gallon of gas um, through the extraction process for the petroleum industry, through the, um, all the way through to burning at the tailpipe, you're emitting around 24 pounds of carbon. And then if we look at the whole transport sector alone, so if we, look, if we combine together cars and trucks and rail and um, um, the um, airplane industry, it's about, um, it's about a third of the um, carbon dioxide emissions from the US and is indeed the largest contributing factor. So if the US is going to combat climate change, it must reduce its emissions from um, gasoline. But the interesting thing about that, when we think about solutions about climate change regarding um, gasoline, we have those solutions. I mean, we can have more fuel efficient cars. Um, the previous administration with the car manufacturers came up with regulations to increase the um, efficiency of cars, something that this current administration wants to remove, which somehow as a, as a consumer I find rather nonsensical. Why wouldn't I want a car that was more efficient and therefore I could get more bang for my box? We've also switched to biofuels. Biofuels reduce carbon dioxide emissions from our transport sector by about 80 percent. And then finally we all also have our hybrid or electric cars. We've seen the success of Tesla. And then all our major manufacturers now have electric cars. So regarding this, although there is this apparent trend, it can be quite easily solved. And if we go to some of our developing world counterparts, there are drastic changes. In the UK, they're going to ban all gasoline and diesel emissions within the next 15 or so years within our urban areas of the United Kingdom. And there are other such moves within the European Union. 
But lastly, I want to just touch on uh, your particular area of expertise, sea level changes. Given current temperature trends, uh, what level of uh, sea level rise, and, and assuming that we continue with a, a business as usual scenario, what level of sea level rise can we anticipate by 2100? And, and, and just broadly speaking, what will the major economic impacts of that sea level rise be in the United States in your view? Well, sea level rise is a very useful barometer of climate change because it takes into a, so for the oceans to rise it takes into account changes in ocean temperature which cause our oceans to expand and it takes into account air temperature which converts the water in ice in our ice caps glaciers and ice sheets to transfer into our ocean basin so it's a very important barometer and the sea level rise rates that we're experiencing now are faster than anything we've seen for the past two and a half thousand years so we are very clearly in an anomalous period. We also know that it's attributable to human activities. Around 50% of the rise that we see, for example, along the US Atlantic coast is due to human activities, increasing atmospheric temperatures, raising the surface of our oceans. Now, sea level rise, even in the smallest amounts, has devastating effects. It can contaminate our drinking waters. It can inundate agricultural land. It can, it can affect our ecosystems, and it can make storm surges much more powerful. As we move through into the 21st century and beyond, one thing we are certain about is that sea levels will continue to rise, and that they also the rate of the rise will accelerate. What alarms the climate community regarding sea level rise is that if we have a business as usual scenario over climate change, that we're going to start to affect our sleeping giants, which are the Greenland ice sheet and Antarctica. And they hold within them colossal amounts of water. Greenland holds within it about six meters of water. If it was all to melt, sea levels would go up six meters. Antarctica has 65 meters of water within it, over 200 feet. And the worrying signs are that these ice sheets are starting to degrade and collapse. And if you have a business as usual scenario, the latest indications from, our, from the climate community is that sea level by 2100 could rise just from that ice sheet alone over one meter. And for the US Atlantic coast, it's very, very worrying. A rise of over one meter from Antarctica the US Atlantic coast will become a hot spot for that. And the rates of rise, we're currently experiencing around four millimetres per year. The rates of rise towards the end of the century, if we don't do anything about climate change, will be somewhere in the excess of 40 millimetres per year. Now, what are, the, what are the profound impacts of that? Well, if we want to highlight one recent event that devastated the mid-Atlantic shoreline, and that's Hurricane Sandy. Now, Hurricane Sandy was an unusual event. It had an unusual track. It was a slow moving large storm, but it was on top of a baseline and that baseline is sea level. So sea level has been rising along the US Atlantic coast. And our research group has been looking at how sea level rise affects how often Hurricane Sandy occurred in the past, how often that type of event occurs at the present and how often it would occur in the future. Prior to the Industrial Revolution, an event like Hurricane Sandy occurred approximately one every 500 years. So an event that was very rare occurred six or seven, there were six or seven lifetimes before an event of that magnitude. Because sea level has risen, and it's risen about 30 centimetres since the Industrial Revolution in and around New York City, that event occurs approximately every 25 years. If we don't do anything about climate change, by 2040, 2050, so within our lifetime, Hurricane Sandy may occur every five years, twice a decade. Hurricane Sandy caused $70 billion of damage to the US Atlantic coast. It affected people's lives. People lost their lives, lost their homes. And that gives you the seriousness of climate change. We have hope. So if you don't do anything about climate change, Sea levels in and around New York City will rise around 1.3 metres by 2100. If you do something about climate change, maybe those rises will be 60 or so centimetres. When they're at those rates of rise, we can adapt. And therefore, we can continue to live, work, 
recreate along the coastlines. If you don't do anything about climate change, you're going to have societal change. We're not going to be able to protect our coastlines. People are going to have to migrate. And that clearly is the urgency about climate change. Yes, as a community, we have hope, but we need out that our elected officials to act upon this scientific facts. Well, clearly, the costs of inaction are staggering. And uh, hopefully, other levels of government in the United States will fill the void uh, under an administration that seems determined to do everything possible to exacerbate the climate crisis. Uh, this has been Dimitri Lascaris speaking to Dr. Benjamin Horton about current temperature trends. Thank you very much for joining us today, Dr. Horton. Thank you very much, Dimitri. And this is Dimitri Lascaris for The Real News.